salam and peace. Uh, this is Imam Malik Mujahid, and you're watching Muslim Network TV. We go coast to coast, not to south, east, west, throughout United States, Canada, and Mexico, with 57 million subscribers on Galaxy 19. And we are available on OTT devices like Apple TV, Amazon, Fire TV, Raku. And you can download our app or go on our website, muslimnetwork.tv. Um, it's a, you know, it's an, it's a day which uh, is making history. For the first time in the history of America, a president is being impeached for the second time. I don't know how votes are going, probably Democrats versus Republicans, some Republicans joining. I don't know if any Democrats opposing that. Whatever it goes, but what happened last, uh, just a week ago, the invasion of the Capitol Hill. We have three branches of government, as you know, uh, Congress, legislative branch, that is, administration, and judiciary. Election took place. Uh, president refused to accept results. Uh, he used uh, different means, legal means, uh, recounting, uh, submitting to the court. Uh, nobody seems to accept those positioning. Some of the Republicans also stand by the results. And then one branch of the government, administrative branch, started issuing statements and go wild and come on 6th. Why on January 6th? What is significant about January 6th? Why that date was chosen? Well, that day is when the final stamp, a formality essentially will be fulfilled about the election by choosing the new president. And then he asked, we will march, although he did not march, but people did go wild. Some were dressed as wild, uh, some were taking selfies, but some erected gallows and nose. What is going on here? We have an expert who knows some of these things and uh, he's pretty busy. Media is talking to him. I hope that media attention remains on the issues which he researches and other people emerge to help America understand a real threat, which is not foreign, but domestic. So with me, guest is Ari uh, Perilgar. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Eri is a professor and director of a School of Criminology and Justice Studies, University of Massachusetts, Lowell. Well, uh, Eri, right now your fellow uh, from Boston, Jim McGowan, is leading, Representative Jim McGowan is leading an effort to impeach uh, President Trump. And on the House floor, uh, closing the first debate on the rules and procedures about his impeachment, he called the invader to the Capitol, quote unquote, out of control mob, fascist, and domestic terrorist. How do you define them? Are they out of control mob, fascist, or democratic? Oh, sorry, domestic terrorist, or all of the above? So I think we are dealing with domestic terrorists. We are dealing with groups and movements that are interested in shaping the political system, the political reality by using violence, by attempting to terrorizing the public, as well as, as we've seen on January 6th, terrorizing policymakers and political leaders. Uh, they, they acted because they wanted really to, to generate the psychological impact that we tend to associate with acts of terrorism in order really to try to shape the political reality. So in my view, we are really dealing with, with domestic terrorists. I'm not sure it was really an uncontrolled mob. The more information uh, we receive about the events on January 6th, we see that a lot of the aspects of this attack were actually organized. 
and plan in advance. Moreover, we, if you listen to some of the leaders of these groups, they were very clear about their intentions to try to disrupt the certification of the election results. They were very clear about their willingness to use a force and violence in order to ensure that Trump stays as president. So it wasn't really surprising. And again, I'm not sure if it was uncontrolled. It was uncontrolled definitely by the uh, Capitol Police. It was definitely controlled by some of the prominent leaders of, of these groups. So I think it, it's easier for us sometimes to think about them as some kind of an uncontrolled mob, but that was not completely the case. It was an organized event in which many of the leaders of this event said in advance that they are uh, willing to push and to promote even violence and force in order to ensure uh, that the president stay in place. Hmm. But when you look at the images and the how, you know, going around taking photos and selfies and uh, it seems uh, wondering uh, maybe some of them first time, uh, do you think about 8,000 people, as they are said, who invaded the Capitol Hill, um, a smaller percentage, maybe the domestic terrorists who have clear goal and clear agenda, the uh, rest of them were uh, sort of excited to be there. Uh, how do you differentiate? Because you see, the challenge here is 74 million people voted for President Trump. Now, they are not definitely in by any stretch of the imagination uh, in the first category. Uh, but those people who showed up, some of them first time in Washington, D.C., some of them have given interview. They have never been to a rally or a march or anything. So, so, so were there multiple types of elements within that? I, I definitely agree that we need to adopt some more nuance. Uh, definitely, many of the people who participated in the event, in the protest, in the in the march, were individuals that were just you know there to uh, express their support for the president and to. Uh, do what they believe they need to do in order to support this idea of stop stopping the steal or, or, or not letting a uh, stealing the elections. Uh, but but I, I I think we need to to remember that eventually the organizational infrastructure that exists is something which is a fairly organized, uh, fairly robust, and it has multiple domains. They have, we're talking about some groups such as the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters and the Proud Boys who have a fairly uh, organized infrastructure that allowed them to mobilize significant amount of activists to Washington DC. And naturally you also have, you know, a lot of people who, who showed up not as part of these organized groups. However, the dynamics, the, uh, 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 the events eventually were led by those individuals who were planning uh, to try to use violence. The fact that some of these activists were actually prepping in advance uh, pipe bombs, the fact that some of them were equipped with, with gears to, uh, uh, to cause damage, that shows you that there were some, at least some elements within this broad and uh, group of people that had in mind, or at least thought in advance about the, uh, the need uh, to use violence or about their desire to use violence. Now, when we're talking about the 75 million people who voted for Trump, it's important to remember that, yes, most of these people are probably not supporting of political violence, are not supporting for undermining our democracy. People vote the way they vote for many different reasons. Some of them because, uh, and the Supreme Court composition is important for them, some of them because they care more about economic policies. We have to remember that there's multiple uh, uh, elements that eventually uh, determines how people vote. However, we do need to acknowledge that there's a, a substantial portion of this constituency that truly see the federal government in a very hostile manner, that see the government as a threat to their freedoms, to their constitutional rights, Hence, they feel under siege and willing to do a sometimes very extreme a, or engage in very extreme activities to try to prevent that. And we've seen that, a, unfortunately, on, on January 6th. Now, as you know, today a vote is taking place about impeachment. 
One of the concerns I have is that uh, uh, Democrats almost all will be, uh, probably all will be in support of impeachment. And a large number of Republicans uh, will vote against it. So do you think uh, some of those who invaded, some of those who are domestic terrorists, uh, they will feel uh, when it comes to the support of the president, uh, Republicans and Congress and they stand at the same. Uh, I mean, do they draw some comfort uh, with this fact uh, that they stand together in support of President Trump? And is this somehow validate in their mind the action they took in terms of violent uh, uh, actions? I'm, I'm not sure. I think I think you know many of the congressmen, and I don't want to you know speak for them, but my impression is that many of them feel that uh, this is that this presidency is really almost over. So there, it's really not necessary to engage in this kind of, of uh, processes. I think also that uh, some of them uh, feel that uh, it's not something which will be useful for the, you know, for this process of healing the country. Uh, I do think that political leaders should be accountable when they're using a toxic language that can lead to violence. We've seen that again and again in many in many places all over the globe, where the uh, uh, the unresponsible use of toxic, contentious language against your political leaders eventually can lead some extreme elements of your camp to use violence against your leaders. So. I do think that the important thing is that we're sending a signal to political leaders that they need to be even more than regular people. They need to be very conscious about the fact uh, uh, that people take their words seriously. And when they de delegitimize their political opponents, when they delegitimize the democratic process, this, is, this kind of rhetoric eventually has consequences on the, uh, on the stability and the resiliency of our democracy as well as on a, a on the ability to uh, a, to preserve the safety of people regardless of their political views so in my view political leaders should be accountable when their words eventually leads directly to violence i'm again i'm i'm i'm, I'm all for the i'm all for free speech i'm all for a uh, protections on the freedom of speech however you need to know that when you are in a in a place of power, in your position of power, when you have millions of followers, you need to be responsible for what you're saying. And when you're telling them, go and march to the Capitol, when you're telling them that the entire process is, is not legitimate, it's corrupt, eventually, you know, you, you, should, you should be accountable for what the consequences of using such language, especially as you were warned again and again, endless times. Let me ask you this question. I mean, the department you're in, uh, you know, uh, leading um, study of criminology and uh, just justice studies, how much of it is devoted towards the uh, domestic and how much it deals with the foreign? So I'm, I'm, I'm less... I don't want to speak specifically about my department, but I'll talk about the field in general of the academic community who study uh, political violence, terrorism, and, and different and similar phenomena. Uh, I think that, you know, definitely the great majority of scholarship was focusing on uh, jihadi groups and uh, what the field described as uh, jihadi terrorism, groups such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS and similar groups and their uh, violent campaigns. Uh, when I started studying the American far right 10 years ago, there were very few, really very, very few people. I have to admit that in the last six, seven years, we see a uh, growing attention, at least on the academic level, to this uh, threat, uh, to these groups and movements, and especially to their rhetoric and their uh, use of violence. Uh, and definitely in the last two, three years, uh, we see a really uh, a significant boost to the field in the sense that a lot of young scholars, uh, young academics and practitioners are really focusing on this. I also have witnessed 
uh, changes in the in the federal government. You know, ten years ago there were no real any grants, for example, or federal money for studying domestic groups or especially on the far right. Uh, but in the last uh, four or five years, most of the major uh, federal funding uh, entities do provide uh, resources and funding for studies of. Uh, of far right groups and 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 other domestic uh, militant uh, movements. So if you have to, you know, just guess. I I don't expect you to have a very accurate response to what I'm about to ask. If you have to guess, if hundred uh, federal dollars are going to uh, study a foreign threat, uh, what percentage is going to study the domestic threat? Oh, I think it's it's these days it's fairly close. I think again, several years ago, it was very the asymmetry was very clear, very obvious. Uh, now it's it's very different. Now I would say that it's almost fifty fifty again. Wow, oh, it's so a it's a rough estimation, but no, no, yes, I I can tell you that uh, you see again and again that federal uh, uh, federal funding sources such as the NSF or or the National Institute of Justice and others are really uh, 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 shifting a lot of resources to scholars, to organizations, uh, to public initiatives that are focusing on uh, trying to deal with this threat of racism, of hate crimes, of hate uh, hate speech, and more specifically, academic studies who are trying to uh, study this phenomenon. Uh, how come I, uh, this didn't happen after Oklahoma bombing? So I think I think there are several reasons. I think that one of the things that differentiates what happened in the mid '90s and today is that uh, the uh, the overall violence was not as high as we've seen. Oklahoma was in many ways an outlier. Right, we don't. It wasn't a part of a, a growing trend of increase in the levels of far right violence. What we've seen basically since 2008 is that there's a steady increase in the level of far right violence in this country. So that's one thing. There's, a, there's a, right a, the election of President Obama, who was considered to be yeah. Yeah, yeah that, in Kenya and a secret Muslim, none of that to be true. That's but, one of the factors, as mm -hmm. well as the the uh, economic crisis. There were it was multiple factors, but yes. So, but since two thousand eight, we see a dramatic increase, and it's very consistent this increase. So I think that eventually it was very clear that this is a growing trend that needs to be uh, dealt with. That's one thing. Secondly, I think that it's important to remember that the perception about terrorism these at, in the 90s was very different. Most Americans, including policy people, when they thought about terrorism, usually they thought about terrorism as a foreign policy problem. They thought about different, they thought about Middle Eastern terrorism, they thought about terrorism, the left-wing terrorism in Europe. Terrorism was not was never really perceived as a domestic policy issue. This is why we use different terminology, such as hate crimes, for example. And 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 because of that, in many ways, they saw Oklahoma City as some kind of an outlier of one person. And I think we failed to understand that he represents really a wider movement. Uh, and the focus was mainly on the militia. So several states legislated uh, some. Uh, uh, some laws that uh, prohibited the military trainings, especially by civilian groups and so on. Uh, law enforcement did uh, put more efforts to curb the different militia groups that Timothy McVeigh came from. But the per overall perception was not that we are dealing with some kind of a social threat, something that really encompassed huge parts of the American, uh, American society. And what we see now is that a uh, far right rhetoric is something which is more visible in mainstream politics. Some we see much more mainstream politicians using and mentioning conspiracy theories that in the past were really the domain of just of fringe groups. And also we see that there is a growing uh, support for different conspiracy theories that emerge from the far right. So all these trends together, I think, created a situation where I think, you know, policymakers, practitioners and academics understood that, okay, it's about time that we invest more resources in studying this threat. 
You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with Professor Ari Perliger, and we'll be right back after these messages. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Adam. You remember me? I appeared in so many episodes that Sound Vision has put on the market. No matter what. It, oh, hey, what's happening? Hey, oh, sorry. Lockdown is what it is. Well, continuing here. In this lockdown, Sound Vision never stops thinking about you, the viewer. We'll have to get back into production again, online and in line. <laughs> Everybody in their own space, e even me. Although I'm stuck with Lanisa. Salam, <laughs> salam, salam. <laughs> I know, I know, you were shocked too. Well, l let me continue. Uh, this is um, this is what I was going to say. Salam, salam, salam. Cut, cut, cut. <sighs> Finally, I get my own screen time again. Thank God. And so we invested in new equipment to bring you even better production with new songs and new singers and animations. Well, here are a few clips. And Sound Vision has brought all this into your home, making Islamic values and teachings easy. And if you know me, Adam, a multi-talented actor, <laughs> well, sometimes I'm an actor and, and the reporter and the, oh, that's enough, let's move on to the next section. Well, you can watch these new episodes on our new app at www.adamsworldapp.com. We have previews happening every day on Muslim Network TV. Sound Vision has been serving generations, moving and changing with the times. We are all faithfully connected. That is a huge blessing. Your donation helps keep these programs available now and into the future. We take this job of helping tomorrow's Muslims today seriously, and you should too. Today, we need your help. Children absorb and learn from everything they encounter. Make that wholesome, positive, grounded in our faith, Together, we can accomplish our goal of raising better Muslims, better neighbors, and better citizens. Please donate generously. It's an investment in our future. But to finish, let me tell you there are new scripts on my new mission. And it is something that I enjoy talking about. My new mission is space. Houston, we do not have a problem. <laughs> Salam, see you soon.
Welcome back. Uh, we're, this is Imam Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with Professor Paligir, and we are talking about domestic terrorism. Uh, but also, I think in academic uh, research, it probably helps that there were a large body of scholarship which was already devoted and trained in the study of the foreign terrorism. And now they have opportunity to add another element to their study find another source of uh, funding for that. But do you think the knowledge of foreign terrorists in some ways is helpful for us to understand the domestic terrorism? I do. I think that uh, many of the people who are studying the American far right are also uh, studying uh, or studied in the past the European far right and far right also in uh, Latin America. So we do, many of us do have this broad perspective. Before I started studying the American far right, I studied far right in places like Israel, uh, in, in different European countries. I looked both into more violent groups. I also looked into uh, far right parties. So I do think that this is extremely helpful, mainly, mainly because first of all, these groups are inspiring each other. So we shouldn't think that what is happening here doesn't inspire and influence similar uh, uh, white supremacists in Europe, in Latin America, in, 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 uh, in Asia, or in other places. There's always this kind of interaction, definitely in, in, our, in today's global world, where the internet really can connect communities uh, from very uh, uh, far places. Uh, and, and moreover, I think there's also a lot of ideological convergence. We see, for example, one of the things that we see in the last few years is this a growing rhetoric that is focusing less about a particularistic a nationalistic issues, but more about this kind of a global a white race, global Christian Protestant white race that needs to uh, be defended, need to be protected, that is under oppression, that is under threat. If you look into the manifestos of, of various European uh, far-right ideologists and American ones, you see that they're not just talking anymore about uh, white Americans or white Europeans. They talk about a broader cultural clash uh, between uh, uh, Christians, white people, and other, and other groups. So in many ways, they feel that they are part of, of uh, some kind of a global network of people who it's their duty, uh, and I'm using their words, to protect uh, uh, the rights and the privileges of the, of the white race. So white supremacists on both sides of the Atlantic and in other places are both very, very uh, active. They collaborate. They have their own cultural domains. So for example, one of the most prominent domains or cultural domains of the far right is the music scene. So there's, uh, there's they have joint concerts and joint uh, uh, events of white power music festival, both in Europe and the US. And this is a place where we see a lot of convergence where they can communicate with each other, can, can uh, uh, replace ideas and so on. And so there's, there's uh, definitely uh, a lot of uh, uh, benefit from looking also into similar groups that are operating in other countries. Is this what you meant when you wrote uh, in an article which I read online that most scholars agree that some American far-right groups are involved in foreign conflicts and other uh, communicate with foreign groups? Is that what you meant or do you meant some other group? Yeah, no. yeah definitely. Uh, we, we see we had examples of uh, American uh, far-right activists who, are tra who traveled to Ukraine to fight alongside uh, Ukrainian nationalist militias in their fight against, the, against Russia uh, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, and in the past, we always seen these kind of connections. We know that, for example, in the 90s, there, was, there were some attempts to, to create a local KKK chapters in, in Europe. Uh, we know that some of the more significant American skinheads organization had chapters in various European countries, as well as in New Zealand and Canada. So there was always this kind of convergence between American and foreign far-right groups. In many ways, they see a lot of overlap in terms of their goals. They believe that they are protecting similar culture, similar, some kind of, a, in their eyes, some kind of a racial heritage and so on. And, and definitely, 
uh, because both in the US and in Europe, we see significant demographic changes uh, in both countries, far right groups are focusing on uh, issues such as immigration policies and demographic changes and the threat from minority groups and from foreign groups and so on. So they feel that they have a lot in common and that they are facing similar challenges. In terms of talking a little bit about uh, how this group emerged, I mean, do you see uh, Al-Qaeda, for example, uh, they were rebels to their own government, to the, you know, Saudis against the Saudi government, the Egyptians against the Egyptian government, and uh, they uh, essentially has grievances against their government, and uh, government was suppressing them, torturing them in some cases, and uh, no freedom of expression, uh, no democratic processes, and no means available to express themselves. And uh, eventually they turned into a terrorist group. And America became target, say, because they are the one who they believe, I think, controlled Saudi Arabia or Egypt or countries like that. But it started out against grievance against their government. Uh, if, if this, uh, I mean, this is a very big generalization, but if you think this is true, I want you to help me understand is the people who are against the federal government, a very large number of people, they are not violent people, but they have grievances against the federal government. Yeah, I, I, I think that, I, I... I probably hold a, a bit of a different view. We have to remember that when Al Qaeda was established, uh, he was, or at least the precursor of Al Qaeda, he wasn't fighting against their own government. These were Arab volunteers fighting in a civil war in a foreign country, right? The Arabs who joined Bin Laden and Abdullah Azam and eventually went to fight in Afghanistan. They oh, fought. That is they fought. Like the CIA recruiting them, right? But who are these people? Not every. But, but these were. I, I'm just saying that those volunteers that joined uh, Bin Laden and Abdullah Azam and eventually went to fight in Afghanistan, they were not fighting their own government. They were not fighting in Saudi Arabia or in Yemen or in any other of the Arab countries. They traveled to Afghanistan to fight in a civil war in a different country. I'm, as part of what they believe is some kind of a defensive jihad. That means protecting. Muslim lands from infidel forces. They felt that they need to take part in this, in this struggle. And it's, I think it's also important to remember that eventually, uh, um, and again, I'm not the biggest experts on Al-Qaeda, but uh, my understanding is that uh, Al-Qaeda and similar groups actually completely reject the idea of a nation state. So when they're talking about a polity, they're talking a polity which is based so on, they are, they are on not religious creed, not a nationalist creed. Okay. So in that way, the idea of national government, they reject. So it's an ideological thing again. So what I'm trying to understand is that if these people who have uh, international ideology of white Christian are dying out, and uh, it, it, suppose a good number of them voted for President Trump, a large number gathered to hear President Trump, a, probably one third or so of them try, decide to march to the Capitol Hill. And uh, some actually had a plan to carry out their action there. What I'm trying to understand here, Professor, is, 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 is ideological basis of Al-Qaeda or ISIS, uh, was it in the larger population from which some of the people became terrorists? Is it going to be the same in America that a larger number of people buy into an idea and ideology and some of them are going to become terrorists? This is what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that we do see these kind of dynamics. And, and I think that as these perceptions that the system is, uh, is corrupt, that the democratic system is not legitimate, that the democratic system is being manipulated, there is a significant concern and risk that you know, a, a large amount of people or significant portion of the population will be uh, convinced by these kind of arguments. And then eventually some of them will feel that because of that, they don't have any kind of moral commitment to preserve democracy or to obey 
the democratic uh, uh, rules of the game and will be willing to use violence. And we've seen that also in the past when they felt that they need to use violence in order to uh, protest against what they've seen as as a grievance against them, as a, as a violation of their of their rights, as a, some kind of a, of a threat to what they believe is the uh, American way, and and I think that's something which is really plays into a rooted conspiracy theories that exist within the American far right for decades now. The idea that the federal government is corrupt and intrusive and was hijacked by foreign forces and foreign actors is an idea that is is part of the landscape of the far right in the United States for, for almost uh, five, six days, basically since the 70s. So this, this, this kind of new rhetoric that we see now, it's something that is really building on an existing theories and views that were really uh, fostered within various groups of the American far right. So they found a, a comfortable breeding ground and almost all of these groups and almost all of these narratives also emphasize the need to take arms and to fight against this kind of tyrannical federal government. This is why uh, they call themselves militias. They believe that they are the followers of those militias that fought against King George during the Revolutionary War. And because of that, they believe that they are the true representatives of the American way. They, they believe that they are the ones who are still maintaining the American way of life and the American ethos. Uh, and, and because of that, I think it's important for us to understand that they truly believe that the nation is under threat and that they have to do something. And it's not surprising that some of them are willing to cross this threshold, cross the line, and eventually use, uh, uh, use violence. And, and, and you'll be surprised how many people uh, in this crowd feel that, you know, storming the Capitol was the right thing to do. You know, there's a, a, one of the most famous texts that is uh, disseminated for years now by, in, in the circles of the American far right is the Turner Diaries. And the Turner Diaries provide, a, which is really a cherished text by far right activists uh, all over the country, uh, is very explicit about, you know, about the need for a revolution against the government about uh, about a direct attack against uh, against the government so for many of them this is something which is almost unavoidable i would say you're watching muslim network tv this is imam malik mujahid and we're talking with professor Berliger, who is uh, who studies uh, terrorism among all things and we'll be right back after these messages Assalamu alaikum! I love Adam's world because it makes me learn in a fun way. That Adam has green, a green face and um, orange hair. I like this song. I like how Adam sings. I like Adam's world because it makes me... Because it makes me happy. No. No. And here's Adam and here's Anissa. Adam is and his sister. And Adam is a boy and he is very smart.
Download the new Adam's World app at adamsworldapp.com and let's help tomorrow's Muslims today. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Majahid, and uh, I'm talking with uh, Dr. Eri Perliger. Uh, you know, when people express anger, uh, there is some outlet for it, and freedom of expression sort of protects that and uh, uh, as a First Amendment, but, but it also is sort of a psychological outlet. Uh, to whatever frustration and anger or sadness or trouble you have. And once you are blurted out, you're a little calm and uh, get to other business. Uh, but now that, uh, you know, Twitter, Amazon, Apple, Google, YouTube, everyone is, uh, you know, more on the side of controlling that expression. Of course, they have legitimate reason to stop violence and uh, violent rhetoric can lead to violence. And so I understand the logic, but uh, the concern I have is by shutting each and every venue to sh share their anger and frustration uh, is going to lead these people to go underground. They will become more invisible and they will plot and terrorize uh, in, 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 in other fashions. Uh, don't you think there is a real risk of going too far with these, uh, you know, marathon shutdowns? More, around 100,000 accounts have been shut down or different people, but there are 100,000 violent people whose account has been shut down? Probably not, but there's a lot who uh, incite for violence and express support for violence and legitimize violence. And and I'll say from from you know from the beginning, I'm I'm a big proponent of the First Amendment, and I truly believe that these kind of steps should not be taken lightly. However, we do know from a, a, from the past, for example, when 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 law enforcement were really very active in shutting down. ISIS accounts, for example, that it had a, a significant damaging effect on the ability of these groups to uh, mobilize support, to recruit, to uh, 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 to reach out to their uh, to their audience. Uh, I think that we need to be we need to remember first of all that social media is just very uh, a specific aspect of the various ways in which people can communicate with each other. Uh, you know, for me, it's a bit uh, ironic that people are arguing that President Trump's freedom of speech is being heard. He's the president of the United States. He has an abundance of ways in which he can communicate with people, and, uh, uh, and that's not the only one. Uh, but in general, in terms of the principle of free speech, I think that eventually when free speech become a tool, that's supposed to delegitimize the democratic system, supposed to uh, legitimize violence against the system, violence against other people, uh, against political rivals. Then I think it's, uh, it's our uh, uh, role to balance between these rights, the same way that in order to preserve public health, we uh, infringe of some uh, basic freedoms, right? Uh, for example, during shutdowns, people's freedom of movement was, was restricted. We do it because we need to balance between different rights in order to ensure that we serve public health. Similarly, if we want to preserve the health of our, uh, of our democracy, we need to balance. We need to maintain freedom of speech, but we need to ensure that this freedom of speech not be, is not becoming a tool that eventually try to uh, dismantle the system. In terms of leading to more violence because people think that they are being uh, shut down or I, there, I, there's, 
there's conflicting evidence. I do think that uh, what will happen eventually is that most of these individuals, or many of them at least, especially the more active one, the more committed one, will find other platforms such as Telegram, Gab, HN, or any of the other platforms that are available for them in order to maintain their communications. However, this will make it much more difficult for them to reach new recruits, to reach new audiences, because uh, uh, all those alternative social media platforms are much less accessible uh, to the general public. So mm -hmm. again, I'm not saying that we should take these steps lightly, but uh, we do need to balance between different rights in order to ensure that eventually public health and the public of our, uh, of our political system is being uh, maintained. Professor, you say, and I quote, I believe that legally designating domestic terrorist group as terrorist organization will have limited benefit. Uh, I have multiple questions on that. Why? One minute for why, <laughs> but more on uh, uh, what other means do you suggest? So I'll start with why this will be, will have limited benefits. Uh, for multiple reasons. First of all, when we're looking at the uh, designation of groups or states in the international arena, we see that it had very limited impact on these groups, organizations such as Hezbollah, who are designated as a terrorist organization for almost 40 years now by the United States. But don't you think it cuts off their funding and people stay away from these groups? I don't think that we have a lot of evidence that this actually have significant long-term effect. So that's one. But more importantly, the landscape of the far right in this country is so fragmented, is so fluid, is changing all the time. Uh, that, 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 leads, that will lead to situations that, you know, what happened is that once a group is being designated, other groups will take its part. There will be mergers. There will be splits. It's already a very fluid and fragmented landscape. So I think for, even from an operational perspective, you know, people will find other platforms. You cannot really, I think... Well, why, why, our, why our government continue to designate certain groups terrorist organization? Why do they do that? We don't have the legal mechanism to do it yet. We, it doesn't exist. We, we just have the legal mechanism to designate foreign groups. The United States government, Congress, never really created a mechanism, a process which define what is domestic terrorism and how it can be and how we can designate group. Those who uh, uh, promote the idea of, of designating domestic groups are actually arguing that we need, first of all, to pass the uh, appropriate legislation. And then once we have the system in place, we can start designate some organization. This is why the only American group that was designated, as far as I remember, is a rise above nation. Uh, that, sorry, I'll correct myself. It was not designated, but the only one that was designated were groups that have basically a foreign base or a foreign connection. That's how we can do that. But we still don't have the legal process to do it for domestic groups. So tell me what, what the Congress can do uh, to uh, address <laughs> attack on them directly. Well, I mean, other than uh, in trying to impeach President Trump, what is it which you as a professor will recommend Congress to do? What law can they pass which will help? First of all, I think it will be useful to pass a legislation. So if we have really significant organizations that seems that uh, are becoming a threat, we do have this uh, path to use. But more broadly, I do think that the main focus needs to be on the what we academics likes to call the marketplace of ideas. I think that we need to be much more vigilant in countering the spread of conspiracy theories, of the spread of disinformation, the same way that we have a rapid response police units that are supposed to respond to attacks in the physical world, to crimes in the physical world. When we see that there's conspiracy theories that are really evolve very quickly, we need to not to shut them down necessarily, but to present a, a counter narrative, a narrative that is based on fact, that is based on reality that can actually uh, uh, provide some kind of response to this and not just leave the, the field for endless conspiracy theories that are being promoted that leads people eventually to be violent. 
But Professor, why in the world people who are skeptic of the government will listen to the government refuting a conspiracy theory? Because I think that if the government is more transparent, if the government is more engaged, and not just the government per se, but through civic society, through nonprofit organizations, there's many ways in which the government can empower civil society to, uh, 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 to be more involved in this marketplace of ideas. Is there, are, there are two different types of media. There are two different parties. People listen to different things. The other thing is nothing but fake. So in, a, in that divided situation, do you think uh, you know, laws and the government action will matter? I do, I do. I do think that, again, I do think that if we divert more resources to fight this information, uh, to fight hate speech, to fight the spread of conspiracy theories, not by, you know, pushing people through the throat of alternative hate, or... Hate, hate speech is legal in our country. No, I'm, I'm saying, I'm not saying about a, the limiting a, a, a hate speech. I'm saying presenting an alternative, a counter narrative, right? So, for example, when we see endless, endless a, a, a wrongly factual propaganda by a white supremacy groups talking about how immigration is bad for the country or about if actual factual mistakes in their narrative, we need to be able to point that out. I'm not saying it will be easy. I'm not saying that this is a short-term solution, but we need to start somewhere. We need to find ways to create an environment that will be more difficult, at least, for these groups to disseminate their, uh, right. their alternative facts. You know? Our federal government spent $500 million creating videos about ISIS. Do you think that much money will be required to counter domestic terrorist nar narrative? It's a good question. I'm, ho I'm hoping that it will cost much less. Uh, there were a lot of problems with the government's strategic communication uh, operations when, we, when it was directed against uh, jihadi propaganda. I think that uh, at that time it was run by the Department of State and there were a lot, I think, of, of problems with the way it was done. Uh, I do think that, first of all, we can learn from that experience, but I do think that we have much more at stake here. Eventually, we're talking about uh, the government talks to its own people, to American citizens, to American society. Uh, we have various educational mechanisms that we can use. And again, I'm not saying we should uh, indoctrinate people, political views or indoctrinate people. I'm talking about indoctrinating them to the fact, to the reality and preventing them from being uh, basically convinced by various you know, conspiracy theories and, and that eventually have no real base. We, that's, that's, that's the major threat as this domain of online communication will become more and more dominant in, in, in the upcoming years. Uh, tell us, I mean, we, we had, uh, you know, Oklahoma bombing. What steps uh, government took after Oklahoma bombing? And uh, did any of those steps help? So there was much more scrutiny and monitoring of the militia movement. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, many states passed legislation that was supposed to uh, curb their abilities to conduct military trainings and, uh, and similar uh, events. And, and again, uh, poli uh, law enforcement uh, diverted more attention in order to try to uh, prevent these groups from stockpiling ammunition and weapons, from continuing their trainings and so on. But again, we have to admit that at that time, the threat from the far right was perceived as something which is more anecdotal rather than something which is systematic. I think we as a society, we grew up and we understand that uh, uh, racism, xenophobia, exclusiveness uh, are more systematic problems in at least parts of our society that needs to be uh, treated and dealt with. And by dealing with these core problems with these uh, illnesses, eventually we can also reduce the symptoms. The violence that we see are the symptoms of these rooted uh, social problems. So we need to deal with these social problems. 
in an effective way, and then eventually that will also uh, will reduce the, the symptoms. So did President-elect Biden, if he is listening to this show, what is your advice for him? Uh, Uniting the country and fighting terror. I don't think it's, it's, it's not just about presenting a more, a, having a more transparent, a more accessible government, but also I think understanding that a, there's a real need to utilize a different type of rhetoric, a different type of language. And this needs to come from the top and go all the way throughout our uh, various systems of elected officials. I think that is important. I think that it's really important that Hill will foster a, a, a political culture that will focus on what we are sharing, our strong commitment to democratic liberal values, our commitment to, to the constitutions, commitment to uh, the freedoms that we all cherish while understanding that we cannot do that when uh, some parts of our political system and the country are trying to delegitimize uh, uh, the system and these, uh, and these beliefs. So I think, I think eventually the president, more than anything else, is not just the prime executive of our country, but is also a symbol, is also a, 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 an ethos of itself. And his behavior and his posture and his attitudes eventually have a significant impact, as we've seen with Trump, the way his behavior really uh, eroded civility, eroded uh, the trust and support in in uh, in some of our civilian uh, uh, civilian norms and practices. Similarly, if we, uh, Trump by sorry Biden by basically presenting a different role model of president can do can go a long way in. And 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 in addition, of course, diverting more resource, diverting more resources to deal with these social problems that we are dealing with, and their extension, the violence that we've seen. Uh, but we need to be very uh, uh, rigor and very you know vigilant about this. We cannot deal with that if we are basically ignoring the problem. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Eddie uh, Preliger, for being with us to talk about domestic terrorism. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sherdil Khan and Dr. Abdul Wahid, for producing today's show. And thank you for watching. Muslim Network TV is always there 24 7 on Galaxy 19 satellite uh, and Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Raku and your own app and uh, of course on our website. But if you are into YouTube, watch us there and subscribe to our uh, broadcast there as well. Thank you, peace, salam.